Hello, welcome to a new episode of Talk Turkey. Elections are nearing. There's a lot to talk. Uh, and in this video with Murat Demir Serek from Brussels, we're going to talk about foreign policy, uh, policies <laughs> of both the opposition uh, and the government, more or less, right? Yes, Nevshin. I mean, election is in less than two weeks now, almost. And the level of interest also in the West, especially in Brussels, is increasing. Uh, from media, from EU institutions, think tanks. I wasn't expecting this, to be honest, because just a few weeks ago, we didn't see this. And Turkey was even like, in a way, forgotten here. People didn't talk about Turkey, didn't care about Turkey. But also having lived here like for more than 20 years now, I never witnessed such a significant level of attention towards Turkish elections. So I think this this also tells us something. Uh, Turkey is again on the radar of the EU and it's also an interesting development, I guess. It is very interesting because I think up until now, it was always like the expectations were like, I mean, Erdogan is going to win again. So what, you know, like uh, the opposition seemed to have no chances. But for the first time in 20 years, it looks like the opposition might win this race. So I think maybe, I mean, you know, better in Brussels. And that's why there's that people are interested. I mean, the other day in the Economist Intelligence Unit, they had a, like a short report about Turkey. And they were talking about, they were showing different rivals and everything. And then they were saying, well, I mean, it's expected that Erdogan can win with a smaller margin. And in in Turkey, the, you know, Economist Intelligence Units, this report was like a talk of the town for like a few days. People discussed it a little bit. Yeah. You know, everybody says something. Who's going to win? I mean, it's not going to be an easy win for the either side. But for the first time, yes, there's a chance that the opposition can win. But I, as far as I understand, in, in Brussels, in Washington, D.C., in most of the important capitals of, of the world, people are now started thinking, okay, if this guy's... The opposition, if they take over, what is going to be their foreign policy, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, of course, it will have consequences for a broader region because, I mean, despite all mistakes in Turkish foreign policy, particularly in the last 10, 15 years, Turkey is still an important regional power. I mean, elections in Turkey and changes in Turkish foreign policy may have consequences for many connected issues. I mean, we talk about the country involved in different issues in the in the Balkans, in the Middle East, Caucasus, Black Sea, Eastern Mediterranean, Central Asia, and increasingly even in Africa. So Turkey's impact is undeniable. That's also, I think, why uh, people really care more and more about these elections and the potential results. Um, of course, they they can predict what would happen uh, if AKP remains in power, but they don't have much ideas about what would happen in case of an election victory. And this also makes, I think, the Turkish elections one of the significant uh, global events, events of um, the year as well, uh, because it will have consequences. And especially when we consider the global balances, like changing global balances, increased tension between West, Russia and China, Turkey's direction is also crucially important. Um, many countries, they try to position themselves according to this new reality. And I think where Turkey stands, uh, it matters too. That's why it's important uh, to understand the direction of Turkey and understand uh, the foreign policy perspectives of um, two main presidential candidates and their respective electoral alliances. Um, should we start with maybe President Erdogan, AKP and its People's Alliance? I mean, we know the foreign policy of Turkey, but whether they would just continue the same line or should we expect some, some changes as well? Yeah, yeah, let's go ahead. I mean, maybe this is significant. So what sort of a foreign policy will they conduct if they win again? This is a very, very symbolic picture from yesterday. I mean, um, the 20, 27th of April, to put it bluntly. Uh, you know, uh, it, Turkey's first nuclear reactor, Akkuyu, is going to be opened, I think, in 2025. It'll be completely functional in 2025, as far as I know. But yes, I mean, that 20, 27th of April was significant because the first... Um, nuclear rod or what do you, nuclear fuel 
was actually transferred to this um, Akku nuclear facility. And there was a big uh, ceremony and there was a what they call a telebridge, video telebridge between Mr. Erdogan and uh, Vladimir Putin. Mr. Erdogan was not, was not able to attend physically in Mersin Akkuyu. He was in Ankara, but they all had these video links and Mr. Putin is not traveling outside of Russia because of the ICC uh, you know, the decision about, about himself. And also uh, Russia is in a war, um, you know, besides that. So they had this telebridge. That was really symbolic because Turkey's for- first nuclear reactor in Akkuyu Mersin is built by Russians. Not only built by Russians, but be run by Russians. So there was like one uh, Turkish company building this nuclear reactor. They they built the you know the initial initial phase of the facility. Then afterwards they were kicked out by the Russians, so they were not in the, these latest technical uh, levels to put, put put it that way. So they were kicked out. So this is solely built by the Russians. It will be run by the Russians. This nuclear facility and Russians will be basically producing nuclear energy in Turkey and they will be selling this to Turkey from Mersin. So this will how it work. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's actually a Russian facility to put it that way. It's, it's only in Turkey. But of course, the elections are nearing and the government wants to sell this project as like a Turkish project, the first nuclear reactor in Turkey, such a success and whatnot. But this is also very symbolic as the elections are nearing. I mean, um, most of the, I mean, the whole, all of the Western countries, uh, there is that stance between Russia and the West. And this shows us where Erdogan is going to stand mm-hmm. or is going to try to stand. And he has to stand, actually, after the elections because, I mean, unbelievable. How some people put it as like a, what they call an independent foreign policy by Turkey. But actually, Turkey has never been this dependent uh, on, on Russia. Turkey is very mm-hmm. dependent on Russia because of the foreign policies that the government has been uh, implementing for the last uh, few years. We're buying uh, 40% of natural gas Turkey is buying is from Russia still. And with this nuclear reactor, so this is going to be more or less 10% of t- Turkish uh, Turkish energy. So we will be buying more than 50% of uh, energy sources from Russia, which, which is problematic you know i thought turkey it's, turkey found some natural gas reserves and would be even solving more... the issues of european energy crisis no <laughs> yeah i mean yeah of course that's an election thing yeah what they did i mean they went to black sea and then they said yeah we drilled and there's there's natural gas here but actually experts say well i mean the not initial tests were driven. I mean, not necessary tests were driven. They did some initial tests, but it's like, is it going to be feasible? They built all these facilities and all these, you know, like infrastructure and this and that, but maybe there is only gas that will be enough for like a year or two years. So actually we don't know, but you know, they're putting out all these shows just before the elections. Why? Because it really is it's a really tight race for the first time. The government does not feel really relaxed and they're winning and they're not, they're not feeling like that. So they're doing everything they can, putting out all these shows that to, to basically, um, you know, attract their constituents and everything. So this is the game Mark Party plays. And this is that. But I think this this picture is very, very significant as the elections are nearing. What do you think? Yeah, and I think we should also connect this uh, matter to foreign influence and, and domestic politics as well. I mean, this is a prevalent topic in, in Europe and the US, but it's not really frequently discussed in Turkey regarding this information, foreign malign influence. Um, elections are ahead and we see that Russia is playing a particularly significant role and the Russian discourse has become also dominant in Turkey on many issues but uh, we don't really talk about this in Turkey and people don't really recognize this fact and address it I mean clearly Putin has chosen the side I mean he's clearly supporting the current government uh, I mean, in a way, it is also a major risk for Russia in case of uh, opposition uh, victory as well, but at least he has made his choice. Um, but also, I mean, from this foreign um, malign influence, this information perspective, we also had an interesting uh, development uh, a few days ago about uh, uh, the health of the president. Like, uh, suddenly, all these Russian uh, accounts 
started to tweet about the um, president's health. We don't know why it happened, why it was like uh, coming through the Russian accounts. Was it part of a strategy? Was it part of a Russian strategy? It was just random. Um, so that's that's important. But I mean, with this in mind or not, in any case, the Russian disinformation in general, I think uh, it's, it's a matter we need to take more seriously in Turkey after elections as well. I mean, the incident, it, I don't know if it was misinformation or God knows what. The thing is, so Erdogan joined this live interview on some TV and he was answering these questions and questions, quote, quote, unquote, the only interviews he attend to are like basically the ones in, in which government journalists ask some alleged, you know, questions. They, you know, they just hand out questions to those journalists and then they ask them back to back to him. So that's the format. But anyway, so he was answering some questions and all of a sudden, um, awful, I mean, like weird, weird things started started going on. There was like weird sounds and everything. And then they cut the live. And then eight minutes later, they came back and they said, Mr. President had a stomach issue. Uh, and but Erdogan himself was back. He looked really pale and everything, pale and tired. But he said, you know, I had a stomach issue because I had a really tight schedule. And actually, my doctors advised me to rest. But, you know, because we're campaigning, I'm working and everything. So I had a slight stomach issue. I'm fine whatnot. But then he really looks pale and everything. And the day, the day after, some uh, Russian telegram channels, they started sharing that. They started sharing that Mr. Erdogan had like heart issue. For a while, he was transferred to hospital, and they claimed that Erdogan's relatives, uh, Miss Erdogan, Mrs. Erdogan, his children were called to the hospital and everything. I mean, first of all, Erdogan is never transferred to a hospital because he built himself a new palace, and there is a medical facility within the palace. You know, he's he's treated there usually. That there is one thing, but maybe he had a heart issue, somewhat minor, but that we don't know about that because you know it's not transparent in turkey obviously and it coming from russians i mean russians have information about turkey especially about erdogan and his enclave they have really close relationship remember 15th of july we had that coup attempt and even erdogan said and his enclave said the minister said they said they learned that there'd be a coup attempt from the russians because russians have been watching turkey and they had the information so you know this time also this came from the russians i mean maybe it's disinformation maybe it's a psyop maybe not who knows that you know because it comes from telegram channel and whatnot mm -hmm. but yeah. you know all these it was uh, twitter was burning uh with with, with with these news and everything and then we have this uh, director of communications and they published, they shared the message saying that all oh, this is misinformation. Mr. Erdogan is very well, nothing wrong with his health, and he's going to continue campaigning. However, Mr. Erdogan could not continue campaigning. He is attending those rallies where his ministers are running, but he's via video links. Mm -hmm. So he cannot go physically city by city. That's significant because usually Erdogan is like a campaigning monster, right? He does that, he does that very well. And he would be on the field, traveling city by city, delivering his messages, talking to his constituents, talking to his people, whatnot. So apparently his his health is not that well. That's what we're learning. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. yeah. And also like a like a campaign of Erdogan is all also only about Erdogan. I mean we cannot say of the course. same for the opposition because they're campaigning as a team. But I mean as he's number one and there is really no number two within the system. No one can really replace him, even for campaigning, I guess. Exactly. People Listen, wouldn't even care otherwise. Since you mentioned, I want to add this, then you can continue. I mean, uh, well, even like uh, even about foreign policy, I understand most Western countries, I mean, Eastern North Turkey's neighbors also, they take Mr. Ibrahim Kalin seriously. They're listening to him. Usually he's talking to foreign audience and international community, but I don't know why they take him seriously. It doesn't really matter. I mean, Mr. Kalin is somewhat close to Erdogan. Yes, he has access. Yes, they talk. Unlike most of the ministers and bureaucrats, I understand. But the sole decision taker in this system is Erdogan. But Mr. Cullen says, does not really matter. So, but, I mean, I'm, I'm seeing the international community and whatnot, and some, some, sometimes messages from Brussels, they're like, they're quoting Mr. Cullen said so, such and such. Like, dude, who cares? Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> um, <laughs> And also about, I mean, you made it clear about Russia, like in the post-election time, but 
um, if Erdogan remains in power, in a way, he would need to find a balance with the West as well now, because uh, number one issue is still economy. And if he wants to improve the economic situation as well, yes, Russian help and cooperation with Russia is important. R cooperation with maybe Gulf countries is important, but still uh, Turkey's main economic partner is still uh, the EU and the United States. So I guess they would want to continue and even to a certain extent, normalize certain ties. What do you think? Um, I mean, yes and no, I think, because they found a position for Turkey in the in international community, and they are very active and reactive uh, in foreign policy. They have their position in the Middle East. However, um, you're right in a sense, for example, lately they wanted to sit down with the Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, even Erdogan said this openly, that they were working on this. And Bashar al-Assad said openly, well, as long as Turkish army does not retreat in every position they have been holding in Syria, I will not sit down with Mr. Erdogan. That was a backlash and that, that was a really not face-saving face -saving speech, I mean, a reaction for Erdogan he got from Syria. So yes, he's trying to mend some things, but you know, this is Erdogan, you never know. The one, the, one of the rumors is actually because Turkish, Turkish economy is in a dire, very, very dire situation. Erdogan was promised some cash, liquid money from Qatar and Russia, right after it's, there's going to be the influx of uh, this hot money, liquid money from Russia and Qatar right out of the election. He's promised that. So it's like, it's rather about that, I think, yeah, with the West, with the EU, it's impossible for him to mend the relations again. I mean, I, I think they're going to try to work with him again. But, you know, he's the devil we know. But, yeah, we know him too well. Mm, yeah. Maybe we can continue with the, the more, opposition. more interesting one, or at least a part where people don't really have an idea. Yes. Um, from Paul's perspective of the opposition. I mean... I think to talk about this, we need to also provide a sort of a background as well about Turkey and foreign policy, because I believe that one of the major issues in Turkey is that the main focus of the political agenda is domestic. And all these foreign policy issues, global developments are not really a part of the campaign. That's, that's clear. And independently of the campaign, there is no informed debate about such issues, especially in the last few years. Turkey has been sort of disconnected from the global agenda somehow. And this is a major issue. That's why many political actors, including the ones in the opposition, don't really understand certain dynamics in the world, especially new dynamics. Um, their analysis are still based on the facts of like 10, 15 years ago, but things have changed, evolved, and Turkey and certain things um, have rather changed fundamentally. People don't seem to understand this, and our viewers should also understand this context before uh, understanding the view of opposition. We don't have a very clear picture about all foreign policy um, related perspectives, but when we combine bits and pieces coming from um, the opposition side, different statements about different issues, uh, it gives a picture. I mean, I think the main element of the picture is sort of going back to a more traditional line uh, in line with like democratization and westernization perspective of the, the founders of the Republic, uh, the traditional line of foreign policy. And but while doing this in a way, they would also maintain the influence created in the last 15, 20 years. And it's okay, partially by AKP, but more than that, partially by the global dynamics it happened. Um, what does it mean practically? I don't expect, for example, that they would stop relations with the Gulf countries. I don't expect them to, uh, to be less active in Africa. Uh, but of course, priorities will change and the priority regions will not be, uh, will not be those. Uh, Russia is going to be a complicated matter because of uh, what you said also uh, about dependency. So it's impossible to cut the, this dependency very quickly. Uh, so they will need to find a balanced way to deal with Russia, which is not going to be very easy. Um, in a way, all these Russian investments, uh, the nuclear plants, uh, pipelines and everything. So. Uh, 
it requires, I think, a sort of balancing act. On the other hand, of course, like we see that, I mean, in, in Germany, the dependency level was even higher, especially in terms of energy. And within one year, they could change a lot. So if there's political will, things can also change. Um, when it comes to China, again, I think many people in the opposition are confused, but uh, one indicator is clear especially coming from the main opposition party, CHP, and also the partner, E-Party. They are sensitive about one particular issue, it's the Uyghur issue. Uh, they've been very vocal about this. So this also means that, yes, probably the relations with, with China will just continue, but it will be much more balanced in that sense, because uh, we have been seeing that this relationship has become more like one way, in a way that China is... Uh, trying to profit from this, and Turkey remains silent uh, about the issues in China. This may, this may change, and the EU will be one of the most important uh, topics, of course. And there we face with uh, a major challenge because the relationship between Turkey and the EU has become increasingly transactional. I mean, this was feasible in the short term; it's not really aligned with the long-term interest of anyone. So. The, the focus was migration to a limited extent, energy, uh, even more limited extent, security cooperation like Ukraine and all. Uh, so this will need to change. Um, but to what extent the opposition will be able to change this? Also, it, it also depends on the, the EU's perspective as well. So the main dynamic will be whether the EU is actually uh, ready to change certain things, whether they can really form uh, certain strategies to to do this as well. So, but as long as the government goes in the direction of democratization, I mean, all democratic reforms they promise to do, actually, we are talking about, again, another EU process, because uh, they talk about rule of law, they talk about uh, fundamental rights and freedoms, um, increasing... Um, the independence of judiciary and all and there's only one benchmark there actually just going back to the copenhagen criteria and the eu eu values so in that sense the direction will be clear uh, but to what extent it will be going to the dynamics of turkey relations like 15 20 years ago that also depends on the willingness of the eu and last point maybe us nato um there are issues and i think we will continue to see some of these issues so it's not going to be very easy from day one i don't think you can solve all issues with the us uh, but i believe that the main problem between us turkey relations is first of all a trust issue and secondly the image of uh, especially for the us the image of turkey so with this change i believe that there will be an opportunity to sit together and work on a new uh, sort of relationship as well between US and Turkey. So this will at least give a chance to, to opposition to uh, sort of reestablish ties with US. What it would mean practically, it really depends on, I think, uh, those negotiations, but uh, there's a lot on table in any case. And uh, one thing is clear that I don't think uh, they would ever question uh, Turkey's NATO membership. It is also part of this, I guess, traditional uh, foreign policy line of Turkey, that pro-NATO line, and especially considering the potential tension if they try to decrease the dependency on Russia, I guess they wouldn't want to question the, the NATO membership at all. Yeah, yeah. To, to to add to your points, yeah, I mean, when we talk about this Erdogan government, it's only a one one man government, obviously. The difference with the opposition, it's more than one man, actually, several people. They came together, they're working together to seize the power in Turkey. I mean, through elections, of course. Uh, and also foreign policy wise, we cannot talk about like there is no one person that we perceive as a to be, you know, foreign policy chief of the opposition. Rather than that, there are several figures. But what unites them, what they have in common, is they're all coming from Turkish foreign ministry. They are all former diplomats. There's Unal Çevikos uh, with the CHP. He's been at CHP MP for like, uh, 
I think more than two terms now. Uh, he's one of the prominent figures. Uh, there is Ahmet Erozan with uh, E Party. Also, he's a former diplomat. You know, Kani Torun from Gelecek Partisi. He is also former, like all these former diplomats. So that signals returning back to, as you said, classical Turkish foreign policy. And Ünal Çeviköz, he gave an interview the other day and he said, he mentioned that it's a non-intervention of domestic affairs of the neighbors, uh, uh, impartial foreign policy and going back to international norms. So it's more or less what you described. Of course, that's that, that is the outline. There's also a very, very important figure, I think, uh, who, he's now running for MP uh, for CHP, also a former diplomat, Namık Tan, he tweeted. Namık Tan is a very significant figure because he was the ambassador of Turkey for the Washington DC, and also he was the ambassador of Turkey for, for a period uh, to Israel, Tel Aviv. There are not many Turkish diplomats who had the chance to serve in these very significant countries, both Israel and the United States, very significant for Turkey. The relations are very important. So he served as an ambassador in both. So he knows a lot about Turkish foreign policy uh, and the different, how to say, powerhouses around the world uh, that are important for Turkey. So he puts uh, their foreign policy, I'll read very briefly. Sometimes less is more. Don't confuse haste with speed. Acting overzealous doesn't equal being effective. And the only way to make a difference is to work efficiently and put in the hours. Turkey's foreign policy today is based on rhetoric, but we need less talk and more considered actions. Strategic autonomy only works if we're respected in the alliances and the organizations we belong to. And he starts, these are the keys. This was his first tweet. These were the following ones. So yeah, I think he put it very, very clearly. I understand if the opposition wins, there will be a very pro-Western atmosphere in the beginning or pro-Western momentum. But yes, the EU has to seize that. Also the United States this time. Because AK Party in their first years, you know, entrance into the EU, this candidacy process, this and that, you remember very well. There was that pro pro Western pro EU momentum, but then you know this happened, that happened, and EU also missed the chance. So, mm -hmm. I mean, they really have a chance because the, the opposition they are they are really they really want democracy. You know they you know they are really as as a principle, and they have to actually because there are six parties, and the only way that they can govern Turkey is through democracy and democratic institutions. They are going to need institutions. They cannot just. Uh, you know, ask the institutions and stuff. They need institutions. So, you know, they're really yearning for democracy and they keep mentioning how the EU should be an anchor for Turkey. So that's also important. Mm -hmm. So I think this will be a, this will be a, a really important chance for both Turkey and the West. Yeah. Um, but the question is, like, what the response of the West going to be? So um, that's one of the main uh, problems, I think. Um, because especially in Europe, unfortunately, uh, the situation, all this transactional relationship, okay, they've been complaining about AKP and President Erdogan, but it was in a way convenient for some countries and some leaders, um, because they were just like dealing with Turkey in a transactional way. They didn't need to take any strategic decisions about the country. Okay. The EU process was. Uh, in a way in the in the freezer so i didn't need to need to do anything about it so it was a convenient time for some countries plus all these uh, turkey skeptic ones and in, um, in europe so potentially tough time is coming for them too because um, this will require if the opposition wins uh, it will require also taking some decisions in in europe in the west about what you do actually with the more democratic Turkey, because it's very easy to deal with a non-democratic Turkey because you don't need to take any decisions. But with a more democratic Turkey, you need to find a new role, a new place uh, for such a country in uh, in Europe. So that's going to be the, the major challenge. But in a way, this also explains what we discussed at the very beginning, this increasing interest, because they try to understand but the next step of this understanding should be, of course, uh, forming some form of policy, uh, Turkey policy as well, because we keep talking about 
uh, foreign policy of Turkey, but they also need uh, a Turkey policy, especially in the West. So that is still the missing elements because we know almost nothing about uh, their strategy. There will be adjustments needed. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> So this was, I think, one of two important topics about the elections. Yes. Uh, another important topic is economy. And we can already announce that, I think, in the in the next one, we'll talk about yeah. the economy policies of um, both parties, both opposition alliances. And actually, all those issues, they're also connected because economy and foreign policy will also be very connected uh, following the elections. So till the next episode then exactly stay tuned in see you next time Thank you.